Good morning, aloha and welcome to the Hawaii State Senate Joint Committee hearing with the Senate Health Committee and the Senate Consumer Protection Committee. I'm Jared Kilhokalole, Chair of the Committee on Health, and I'm joined today by members, including uh, my co-chair and vice chair of the Health Committee, Senator Baker, Senator Favela, and Senator San Buenaventura. Uh, chair, would you like to introduce your members? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, my vice chair just joined us, Senator Chang. Of course, uh, Senator Riviere, Senator Favela is also on our committee. And Senator Nishihara, San Buenaventura, and Senator Detroit. We have a full house today. Excellent. Uh, this meeting is being streamed live on YouTube. In the unlikely event that we need to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties, the committee will try to reconvene. Uh, and if not, we will... Uh, Reconvene to discuss outstanding business on Wednesday, March 16th at 1 p.m. And a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. Uh, for individual testifiers, I will call you uh, one at a time with the individuals present in the room first, followed by those joining us remotely. You have two minutes to share your testimony. Uh, your written testimony has been provided to the members and I've reviewed uh, each of them. So I'd encourage you to summarize uh, during your time or use the two minutes to include uh, uh, any uh, individual testimony that you negated in your written remarks. Uh, let me see. If there are technical glitches as we had yesterday, we're just starting back up with this hybrid model. Uh, we may move on and try and come back and accommodate you later. Uh, I'll be reading the list of individuals and we apologize if the closed captioning doesn't accurately transcribe your name. The first measure on the agenda is HB 1758 HD2 relating to nurses. This allows for temporary permits to be issued to registered nurses and licensed practical nurses from a territory or foreign country that are seeking a state license by endorsement. Uh, first up, we have the Board of Nursing with comments. Good morning, chairs, vice chairs, members of the committee. Um, Chelsea Fukunaga, Executive Officer for the Hawaii State Board of Nursing. The board will stand on its written testimony offering comments on this measure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have the Hawaii Co Coalition for Immigrant Rights. We'll need to speak, speak into that microphone. That's so weird. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Uh, Aloha Chair Baker and uh, Chair Keo Kalole and members of the committee, Liza Ryan Gill, co-chair of the Hawaii Coalition for Immigrant Rights. And we are in strong support of this measure for a number of reasons. You have our testimony in front of you. One uh, and probably most prescient is our, short, our uh, professional medical professional shortage and nursing shortage. Well, a record number of nurses are leaving the field uh, due to the pandemic. We are also 18% foreign born, a full 50% of our foreign born individuals are Filipino or Filipina. Many of those of Filipino origin are, have been trained as registered nurses and are being underutilized currently in the state. This bill would help us to streamline that process while maintaining quality and lower barriers to foreign born professionals to be fully actualized within our state. We also know that in language care leads to better health outcomes and we'll be in the room for any other questions, but appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Next, we have Hawaii Friends of Civil Rights in support. Uh, is there Hello, anyone else uh, in? Yes. Uh, my name's Amy. Uh, Friends of Civil Rights. And Agbayani, and I'm representing the Hawaii Friends for Civil Rights, and we strongly support this measure. And uh, I stand on my written testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. That's all the testimony, the live testimony we have registered. Is there anyone else in the room or on the internet who would like to testify? Okay, I'd like to note for the record, uh, the testimony of the East Hawaii region of the HHSC in support, uh, HMSA in support, Hawaii Pacific Health in support, uh, Hawaii Primary Care Association in support, Hawaii State Center for Nursing with Comments, Healthcare Association of Hawaii in support, Queens Health Systems uh, with comments and five individuals submitting testimony, four in support and one in opposition. Members, any questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to the last measure on this joint agenda, HB 2260 HD1 relating to cannabis. Uh, this amends 
uh, various portions of the cannabis dispensary law. First, we have the, well, we'll take the Department of Health. Good morning, Chair Keohu Kalole, uh, Chair Baker and committee members. Um, I'm Michelle Nakata and I'm here on behalf of Director Elizabeth Char, uh, Hawaii Department of Health. The department does stand on its written testimony. However, I did want to emphasize just a few key points. Um, the Department of Health absolutely supports improving patient access to cannabis for medical use. However, our primary concern is that the number of dispensary facilities have tripled in the past three years, and the variety of manufactured products that are being produced by dispensaries has more than doubled while the inspection staff remains at the original two inspectors statewide. Therefore, in order for the department to ensure regulatory compliance um, and patient product and public safety, we do need additional resources and operating costs uh, to support any expansion of the existing system. Um, in our opinion, continued growth of, the of this dispensary system without adequate um, personnel um, and, over, you know, to provide the right amount of oversight um, pretty much amounts to an unregulated system and that jeopardizes public and patient safety. Um, in addition, the department does believe that changes in plan counts, uh, the numbers of facilities, fees, and those sorts of things, um, they should be based on the system needs and the patient needs um, and not on arbitrary figures. Thank you very much for this opportunity to testify and I'll be available for any questions. Thank you. Uh, next we have the uh, Mr. Gantz, Boy Cannabis Industry Association. Law chairs, vice chairs, members. Uh, my name is Randy Gantz, the executive director of the Hawaii Cannabis Industry Association. We represent the majority of medical cannabis licensees in the state. This bill is a crucial measure for our industry at a very crucial time for our industry. Uh, we have worked on this bill for a few years now, and we believe this version is ripe for passing. We also submitted over a little over 800 pieces of individual testimony from medical patients across the state that we've collected that um, go into our dispensaries. And we worked with uh, economist Paul Brubaker in his past interim, uh, released a, a industry report uh, that I sent out earlier this year. If you all need a, another copy, please let me know that highlights some of these patient access issues um, and issues uh, that this bill hopes to address. Um, there's three main provisions in this bill um, and you have our testimony. We, we go into depth in those uh, provisions. If you have any questions, we're here and, and available to discuss. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, we have registered to submit testimony live, Green Aloha Limited. Are they on Zoom? Okay. Well, we'll move to uh, Jason Hanley, Noah Phillips for Hawaiian Ethos. I'm here. Aloha, chairs, vice chairs, members of the committee. My name is Noah Phillips, testifying on behalf of Hawaiian Ethos, one of the medical cannabis. Licensees for the island of Hawaii. Uh, we stand on our written testimony today um, and we make ourselves available for any questioning that you may have uh, for us. Thanks. Thank you very much. I believe that's Mr. Hanley. Go ahead. Aloha, um, senators and representatives. I'm honored to be here today um, to support our farm. Um, I got a timer now, so this is on. So um, uh, we oppose HB 2260. My name is Jason Hanley. I'm the, owner, I'm the owner of Care Wailua Farm, the largest three to nine patient cooperative farm in Hawaii. Why are cooperatives growing so fast is the question. Simply, 90% of medical patients in Hawaii cannot afford the dispensary's prices. This is hurting the people, and if it's not corrected, will uh, be a crisis pushing back people onto harmful pharmaceuticals such as opioids, which, is, which cannabis is now replacing and adding to a productive life. Most people do not have a place to grow or have a place or have the expertise to grow. 
the, the, the committee has an opportunity today to vote no on this bill. We call on the legislators to conduct an audit of the dispensary program. I'm convinced of the audit will show that dispensaries have failed to meet the need of medical patients and overinflated the cost of cannabis. Uh, the over inflation was identified as a concern in 2014 in the Sunrise Analysis Bill conducted by the state auditor. Now, eight years later, patients of Hawaii are in a crisis and cannot afford their medicine. The, medicine. the purpose of creating dispensaries was to provide access to safe okay. medicine, but has prevented uh, patients from affordable medicines. Cooperatives or farms, more than one patient of them are providing safe medicine. We, like dispensaries, test our medicines for pesticides, mold, and heavy metals. Cooperative farms provide a Cooperative farms provide a place for patients to grow their medicine, drastically lowering their costs uh, to patients by half. There is no fear of unsafe medicine and patients may also test their own medicine. Um, we're running out of time here. So I invite all legislators to our farm. Chair Wailua Farm has been visited by uh, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, Senator Kadani and De La Cruz, State House Representatives Gates, Quinlan, Illigan and Daniel Holt. Please do not let dispensaries run this program and claim they are in dire straits. The strategy is to continue to ask for more and monopolize the market. Thank you very One, much. Okay. If you'd like to make yourself available for questions, then uh, any of the members can, uh, can follow up when we've completed the rest of the testimony. Thank you. Let me call out one more time. I have Tai Cheng, uh, Kathy, Casey Rothstein from Green Aloha Limited, and Clifton Otto. Who are registered on Zoom. So if any of you are available, I'll talk a little slower. <laughs> Dr. Otto, please proceed. Good morning, chairs, vice chairs, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on this measure. My name is Dr. Clifton Otto. I'm a cannabinoid medicine specialist and uh, certifying provider for WISE Medical Cannabis Program. Um, I appreciate the short-term goals of this bill, but I don't think that it really goes far enough. If our dispensary program is to be sustainable, we really need to put an end to the federal conflict with marijuana. Uh, I'm proposing in my written testimony a simple amendment to this bill that would be a logical follow-up to HCR 132 from last session, which was unanimously adopted by both chambers of the legislature, and which asks the Department of Health to file a federal exemption application with DEA. Uh, today, we have a Department of Health online. We have several dispensary representatives. I hope that we can have uh, some type of discussion or questions about what it would take for us to feel comfortable with moving forward to do something about ending this federal conflict. I thank you very much for considering my testimony and will be available for any questions. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else on the call or in the room who would like to testify on this measure? Okay, members, any questions? Yes. Okay. Senator San Buenaventura. Um, Department of Health. Thank you. So I, I have a number of questions. Um, so I'm looking at the bill. Yes. And basically, um, last time I think I talked to you folks, do you folks have any plans of opening up the dispensary licenses and issuing more licenses? We're always prepared to, for that possibility, but we've not reached a point where we are having um, patients identifying to us that, that there is a need. I so mean, right now, you, I mean, We've opened up these eight dispensaries, and right now you have no plans on seeking more dispensary licenses. Not at the current time. We, we do constantly assess the patient numbers, the geographic locations um, of where those patients are, uh, you know, as compared to where the retail locations are. We are looking at the production numbers. So uh, the answer is no. Okay, yeah, I just no, want to. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I was just trying Because to I have more questions. Okay. okay. Yeah. So <laughs> when the bill asks to actually remove the annual, remo annual fee, and the application fee. Basically then it just benefits the existing dispensaries, right? Because you guys have no plans in immediately to ask for more dispensary licenses. Um, I think that the, the intent is really to just allow us to, to revise and set those fees by administrative rule oh. instead of having the, the flat 
a flat fee gram. set in statute. And this is kind of a trend that other states are moving towards. They're looking at the actual capacity of a dispensary licensee, how much, you know, how much cultivation, how many plants they're harvesting, um, how many stores they manage, and all of that, and setting the fees based on that information. Um, and this allows... So you want it to be more dynamic. But correct. Right, but the reality is, if you have no plants, and you have it because every time... I've asked whether or not it's Keith Ridley, whether or not you folks are going to ask for more dispensary licenses. The answer was always no. So, but immediately, if we remove those amounts, the immediate benefit are to only the eight existing dispensaries, right? So we won't be collecting the 50 grand for the existing ones, unless you folks already have a plan in place on how you're going to charge the renewal fees. No, and I'm sorry that, but that was not the intent. The intent was not to remove it completely, but re, but replace it with allowing the department, giving the department authority to set those fees um, in administrative rules okay. versus having them set in statute. So my so, apologies if 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 our testimony is incorrect on that. Okay, well, no, it, it it's not. I'm just questioning. Okay. Okay. The other thing is um, my concern. And that's always been my concern was that if we're going to increase the retail which is what this bill wants the existing dispensaries from what i've seen the retail spaces are clustered around population centers so we have like multiple retail places like in hilo and in kona and in metro honolulu so if we increase the retail space it doesn't actually serve the underserved areas correct because they're going to choose where they where they're going to profit which are which are in metros so is there any i mean if we pass this bill is there one you folks have testified that you folks don't have enough money but you don't have any plan in place on how you guys are going to get the monies beyond the fifty thousand that you folks have removed from this bill and two how do we actually serve the underserved areas when you don't increase dispensary licenses or require them if we're going to have the retail spaces to go to Molokai, to go to Puna, to go to Tapu, where they are not serving them? Correct. And so this is one of the reasons why what we are asking is to allow the department the authority to make the determination on where additional retail locations should be authorized and allowed. And it should be based on patient need. Um, it should be um, based on underserved communities. And, and look, the way that the, the, the statute is written now, the department does not have any over control over that other than that there has to be at least 500 registered patients in a county with very little control over dictating where a dispensary can or cannot locate its retail locations and um, we agree that the two big island dispensaries chose to locate their retail stores in the um in a couple of places within walking distance of each other and in it's is our opinion it, it, it that's what resulted in large areas of underserved um, you know, underserved uh, patients. On and and by passing this, it doesn't even guarantee that they are going to go to the underserved areas because it doesn't have any geographical look requirements, right? We understand. So, and my last question is, if you're going to remove the 50 grand annually, and but you still testify that there's need for money, do you folks have a plan to be self-sufficient? No, they we, currently, well, we, this year, the, the program was moved from special funds to general funds. So we are funded by general funds. Um, however, prior to that, we were completely special funded off of dispensary licensing fees, as well as patient registration fees. And you know, our six year projection showed that we could be self-sustaining off of those fees. That was my memory when we first passed these bills. And that, I mean, I, I, I believe that if we are able to properly adjust fees, as I, you know, as I suggest, based on the system needs, based on the program's needs, um, we, we can be self-sustaining. Okay, I have no further questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Members, any other questions? Hold on. Hold on. Senator DeCoy. 
So, so thank you. So uh, now I have a question. Um, so how, how do you still factor in that now you can be self-sustaining mm -hmm. when, when, you, when you're removing the fees? Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you expect to like recoup that with the, with the existing um, dispensaries? Yeah, as I mentioned, I, the, the intent was not to remove those fees. The intent was really to, what, was to allow us to set the fees um, by uh, administrative rules. We, so, so you guys going amount in mind? Is it the existing that you guys are going to be putting back into the existing fees, or are you going to ask for something higher? It would depend on the particular licensee, right? The number of facilities they have, the capacity, the the industry itself. We have eight licensees. Every single licensee's capacity is extremely difficult, different, sorry, <laughs> difficult, different. Uh, some of them are very small, limited operations. Some of them are, are very large operations that, um, you know, based on their, their production could literally be uh, provide to a third or more of the entire state's industry. So it's, it's because it's so dynamic and differing, it just really doesn't make sense, sense to have a set flat fee that each, each licensee is charged. And that's what we would like to do is to be able to make an adjustment, make adjustments, make okay. appropriate adjustments. So, so I want to, we have looked at. Okay. So yeah. let me, let me go to when you talked about the underserved areas. So right now the islands, which I represent Molokai and Lanai does not have a dispensary. Will they continue to be able to self grow? To, to take care of those needs of those patients? I, I will have to look. I, I, know, I do know there were specific statutory prohibitions for, for location of certain, uh, certain uh, dispensaries, geographic, but if they're not, I mean, and the other thing was the, the limitation on number of registered patients, but I believe that it was just county. I don't think it was based yeah. on island. So I would have to go back and take a look at that. I'm sorry. If, yeah, because I think you guys have 500 registered patients in a county, which a I know county. you guys are way over. Right, right. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I have a question. Senator Moriwaki. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so do you have standards that you would apply uh, that you've developed over the years uh, so that if you go to rulemaking, you have standards already in place? Or are you going to start now to try to develop the standards? We've already started looking into it. I don't have anything that's been, um, that's, that's been, um, I mean, I don't have any, any, any suggestions drafted out right now, but um, Hawaii is a member of the, um, the National Cannabis Regulators Association. It's a national organization of states um, regulators, um, and I'm actually on the executive board. Um, and so I have already um, been engaged in almost weekly discussions with other states, and, th and those are the types of dis discussions that we have. How do you make the decision about um, how much plant capacity uh, a production center can manage, you know, based on square footage, based on their personnel, um, based on the size of the facility, based on patient need. How do you make a decision about where to locate retail? You know, you, you take into account uh, geographic distance, commute time, um, and, and all of, you know, access to uh, public transport. Um, so we We've been engaged ongoing in those types of discussions for a couple of years now. So we have a lot of information. It just needs to be synthesized and put together into a plan. So one more question. You say you need uh, uh, staff, um, staff for 155,003 FTE for this year and uh, 290,000 ongoing. Uh, and if you don't have a special fund and you're not collecting fees, mm -hmm. is this going to be an ongoing cost for the mm -hmm. state? Yes, it will be if we uh, if it's not uh, special funded. Because there's no appropriation in this yeah. bill either. Correct. Understood. And that, that's our yeah. primary so, concern is... It's it's so. years with administrative rules. Yeah. Members, any other questions? No. Okay, I have a question. So last year... <laughs> That last year, we gave you the authority to set fees by administrative approval, correct? Those are for patient registry, registration costs. And uh, yes, those are being worked on. 
Um, we have the, uh, the, the changes to the administrative rules um, are in, in draft form. And so you're in the process of setting fees, at least on one part of the framework, Correct. in order to account for these capacity issues, which you noted in your testimony on le similar legislation last year. And then this bill essentially would authorize you to set uh, fees as you determine are necessary on the, the licensees themselves to try and cover costs. Yeah, okay. it's essentially doing the same thing, but on the other side of the house. Okay, so, you know, I, I want to pivot to a question about your testimony. You note that the production facility, uh, the sections that allow increase in production facilities are not justified based off of uh, your assessment that all of the licensee capacity has not been fulfilled. So the one of the testifiers suggests that that notes a lack of appreciation for the difficulties of doing business in Hawaii. I'm sorry. Um, but, I mean, would, would you like to respond to that? Oh, I, we understand. It's It's been a significant challenge for the, for the licensees to stand up their facilities. Um, and uh, so aside from that, so aside from that assessment of overall capacity among all of the licensees, have you done a review of balance sheets of these businesses to determine whether they've reached full capacity or is there some other assessment you've used just besides the rudimentary math? Basically what we've looked at is um, the, the volume of um, plant production, um, the volume of patient uh, of sales. So in other words, the amount of that um, production that's going into uh, uh, products to cannabis and manufactured products um, and resulting into sale because that's also an important thing okay. to take. So do you know, do you have an assessment of how many caregiver co-ops co exist in the state? I do not. Do you I have an assessment to. of their production capacity? I, I do not. Or an assessment of their total distribution? So, so how can you make a reasonable assessment of supply and demand when you have no data on the caregiver co-op framework yeah. and you haven't done a meaningful assessment of the you know the business practices of the licensees understood the the uh, cooperative uh, the caregiver cooperative system is completely unregulated it's not under um so i you're not even able to say at this point whether there could be illegal diversion from the co-ops to non non-certified patients no so wouldn't that be a, a larger liability than potential diversion from the licensees that are under your regulation? It is a concern, and I think it's the reason why in past years the department has uh, tried to um, move up. How many licensee team? violations have you issued uh, in the last two years? In the last two years, I, off the top of my head, it, it's under a hundred each year. Um, and the majority of them are, are primarily for, um, the majority of them actually are for security violations. What, what type of violations? Uh, for um, not, main, not maintaining security, um, perimeter security and um, uh, improper tracking of, of product throughout the system. Um, but in, in all of the cases, the, those discrepancies have been reconciled. We don't have anything that indicates that there's been wholesale um, diversion from the system. In other words, we haven't, we haven't found anything that um, in, um, in our assessment, and we do work closely with the Narcotics Enforcement Division, um, that amounts to a concern that there is diversion occurring from the license system. So, so your assessment is that the, the regulated framework, the licensees as they currently exist, are by and large operating as was intended when we originally did the dispensary bill, which was to not run so egregiously afoul of regulation that we trigger some sort of federal yeah, oversight, right?
Okay, hello. We are reconvening uh, this Tuesday, March 15th, 9.30 a.m. joint committee hearing between the Senate Health Committee and the Senate Consumer Protection Committee. Uh, when we lost the feed, we were taking, we had received testimony and we're taking member questions to testifiers on HB 2260 HD1, uh, which makes amendments to the cannabis regulation framework in the Department of Health. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Senator Revere for a question. Uh, thanks for your patience. Um, so the um, the cooperatives are providing a, a segment of the market, which is different from the dispensaries. And I'm just wondering how we should uh, look at that. And, and should we, is there a regulation for the cooperatives or how, how is that handled differently? There is not. And that is a significant concern. Um, and so uh, basically the only control that the health department has right now, um, because the cooperatives are an outgrowth of um, patient cultivation, right? They're allowed to assign a caregiver to cultivate for them, um, but there's currently no limit to the grow site uh, limitation. So that's essentially what's happening is patients are registering the same grow site for their um, home grow, and, and that's what's resulted in these um, cooperatives. How many cooperatives are there approximately? We don't know. I mean, is it like um, I, five I, or is it like a, a thousand? Is it two, two people makes a cooperative or what's the definition of a cooperative? It's, it's just multiple sites um, of, of growth. And so that's the reason why in past session, we had um, su suggested that uh, there be limitations on the number of um, growth sites that can be registered to a physical location, um, and um, and then also limitations on on um, on the growth on, on the home growth system. Um, Do you use a similar um, for chain of command or um, to make sure that there's no leak or, or you know yeah. You know, malfeasance going on there are you using the same sort of uh, oversight uh, with the cooperatives as i mentioned before we don't have any regulatory authority over that we do have authority to i mean patients are required to tag their home grow plants mm -hmm. and so if we receive a complaint about um you know a, a, a patient who may have excessive um numbers of plants um, at their residence, uh, they are allowed to, to grow 10 per patient. Um, we will do an on-site inspection and verification that the plants are properly tagged um, and um, associated with a currently registered patient. Um, but beyond that, we do not have much authority. It, it really becomes a law enforcement. Do we know how many people are maybe self-growing, home-growing, or maybe in a cooperative? And how many customers of dispensaries do we have? A, we a, have a, a rough number. I, I don't have those figures um, with me right now, but roughly about 60% of the patient population have a registered uh, cultivation site. So in other words, at, at least 60% of patients um, express an intent to home grow when they register for their 329 cards. But we don't know how many of them are also utilizing uh, dispensaries or we don't know the market breakout. We do. We 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 do show that between thirty five to forty percent of patients uh, access a dispensary on a monthly basis because we do we do have the registration numbers, patient registration numbers for patients who make purchases at dispensaries, um, and uh, so we have the total volume of 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 um, patient purchases, as well as um, the exact individual numbers of patients that represents. And it's about between 35 to 40% of patients, of registered patients that act, um, access the dispensary. So it kind of um, matches that 60% of the patients um, So do you think they're exclusive 60 and 35%? You think they're different populace or there must be an overlay? Uh, there is an overlap. Yeah. There are some patients who register to home grow as well as access to dispensary. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just wanna... Senator Baker. Um, thank you. 
One of the things that I'm wondering is because there are other places that have had uh, cannabis laws on their books longer than we have. Mm -hmm. Have you been in touch with any of the ones in Colorado, any of the other states that we that might have established best practices to, to see if there's either amendments that need to be made to our statute or if just administratively, you can make some adjustments to make sure that people have access, they're getting what they're, what the medication that they need. And if there's anything that the legislature might need to do to amend the statute to enable some of those best practices. Those are some of the things that we have been, you know, as I mentioned, the, the regulators association, we do meet, um, we meet as an executive board twice a month and then as um, the membership meets um, twice a month as well. So there's there's a lot of ongoing discussion and on, on that. Uh, we've discussed um, control of, of home grow and cooperatives, you know, and how other states are handling that situation as well. Um, best practices as far as uh, manufacturing requirements. You know, we just updated our administrative rules um, focusing primarily on um, manufacturing practices and laboratory testing um, to update those because, you know, they haven't, those rules haven't been updated since 2015. Um, and but you haven't necessarily shared that information either with the legislature or maybe even with the public, correct? No, we've, we've not really had an opportunity to do so. It is something that we would like to do. Um, it's, it's a matter of competing priorities for you know, activities that we, we have, we're able to engage in. I appreciate that, but if you don't have the legislature in the loop, if there's something comes up that you need, you're probably not going to get it. Understood. So you might want to consider uh, being a little bit more proactive with the, with the committees uh, to give them the information and listen to what questions they have and what other things are coming out of the community that either need to be addressed at the legislative level or you know, ramp up your admin rules. And in terms of your admin rules, have you uh, asked to have a briefing with the legislature to explain some of the things that are going into the rules that might address some of the issues that have come up today? No, we have not. And I, um, yeah, I do apologize. So, you know, as I mentioned, I was out on leave and the rules happened to be um, signed and became effective while I was out on leave. So um, we'd be happy to do that. You might want well. to consider um, that. You know, the program manager position for the Office of Medical Cannabis Control and Regulation actually was finally just filled last week, Monday, mm -hmm. even though um, the the legislature authorized that, that program back in 2019. It's taken us that long to mm -hmm. stand up. So who's, the administration. who's, who's handling that program now? Um, I'm, I was appointed as the program manager. Mm -hmm. So I started in that role um, last week, Monday. So how many hats are you wearing? Uh, currently that one, as well as supervise, continuing to supervise a dispensary licensing section until that position can be recruited and filled. Um, it's, I mean, that's, that's, that's been the limitation. The, the whole dispensary system for the past two years has been three people, um, myself and two inspectors. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Members, any other questions? I have two just to follow up. One is, uh, how many funded positions are there in the office? Currently funded positions, there are, I know dispenser inside out, a uh, whole program 19, I believe, funded. And then how many are filled? Uh, of the 19 positions, we have five plus. Oh my gosh, Sarah Walker. Um, or how I, many are vacant? Do you know? Yeah, so dispensary has two vacancies, registry has two vacancies. So we have, we should have 15 filled positions of board vacant currently. Okay, so you have authority to, you have authority to issue fees to patients. This bill proposes to establish discretion for you to set fees for dispensaries and you have four vacant positions. How many, uh, do you know the total number? Do, going back to Senator Revere's question, do, do we have a ballpark total number of 
of uh, certified cannabis patients in the state? I think, Kurt, uh, I think the last month's count was uh, there are I, uh, roughly about 34,000 uh, currently certified patients. I can provide the exact figure um, as well as the caregiver counts. And, yeah. so, so it's fair to say that there are at least 15,000 patients that are utilizing co-ops, probably as high as 20, maybe even 25. Possibly. that are utilizing the unregulated co-op. Is there an exposure to the state for uh, liability with any of those patients who utilize co-ops and get sick? Or? That's a good question and that's something that I don't know. Okay. I don't know. But it is, I mean, the, you know, the intent of standing up the dispensary system was to ensure access to regulated tested products. And, you know, that's not necessarily happening with co-ops. Okay. Okay. Unless there are any other questions, Senator Baker. Your, your question made me think, is there a need for something in the statute to require regulation of co-ops? That's a possibility. I believe uh, one state, a couple of states, I, I, Washington state, I believe uh, does regulate their cooperatives. They require them to register. Um, and, and, and they, there are requirements that they must comply with. If the legislature chose to go down that road in this bill or something else, would you be willing and able to help uh, put some language together that would at least require uh, minimum regulation with the department abiding by standards that sort of thing. Yes, I'd be happy to look at you know and talk with other states that that do such, uh, do include them and okay. and work on that. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. Okay, if there are no other questions, we're going to recess for decision making. Recess. Okay, we're going to reconvene for decision making on this Tuesday, March 15th agenda. The first measure, HB 1758 HD 2, relating to nurses. Uh, is the first bill recommendation is to uh, amend this bill uh, by making the date uh, effective upon approval. And we also have some technical non substantive amendments. Members, any discussion? Okay, seeing none, Vice Chair, HB 1758, HD 2, passing with amendments. Chair votes aye. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Morawaki? Aye. Senator Sam Buenaventura? Aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Chair, your recommendation's been adopted. Thank you very much. Same recommendation for the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection. Uh, pass House Bill 1758, House Draft 2 with amendments. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair Chang, aye. Senator DeCoy? Aye. Senator Nishihara? Aye. Senator Riviere? Aye. Senator San Buenaventura? Aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Okay, recommendation is adopted. Thank you, members. Okay, last measure on the agenda, HB 2260 HD1 relating to cannabis. The recommendation is to pass this measure out uh, with technical amendments, noting that there's also a defective <coughs> date uh, on the measure. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, Vice Chair HB 2260HT1, passing with amendments. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Moriwaki? Reservation. Senator San Buenaventura? Reservation. Senator Favela? Reservation. Chair, your recommendations adopted. Thank you. <coughs> uh, members on that measure, House Bill 2260 for CPN, uh, same recommendation, pass with amendments. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair, aye. Senator DeCoy. Reservations. Senator Nishihara. Aye. Senator Viruvier. Reservations. Senator San Buenaventura. Reservations. Senator Favela. Reservations. Recommendation is adopted. Thank you, members. Thank you. We are adjourned.
Good morning. All the uh, Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee to order for our 10 o'clock agenda. Uh, we are a little late uh, because uh, we were joint with, uh, with health and there were some technical difficulties. Um, in the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business uh, tomorrow um, at um, 10 o'clock in conference room 229. Um, the meeting is being streamed, uh, live streamed on YouTube. Um, this meeting include, includes the 10 a.m. agenda. There are two items on that agenda. Um, if there's temporary glitches and we have to uh, move to another person, we'll come back to you if we have time. Uh, we'll be le reading a list of individuals who submitted written testimony for each measure. We apologize if the closed captioning doesn't accurately transcribe names. If you're interested in reviewing the written testimony, go to the legislature's website. You'll find a link on the status page for this measure. Uh, our time slot ends at, at 11 o'clock. It is 1035, so we are going to get started post with. Okay, the uh, first item on our agenda is House Bill 2243, House Draft 1, relating to condominiums, requires buildings and structures to be maintained in a safe and sanitary condition, requires devices and safeguards to be maintained in conformance with county building codes, and condominium associations or their designated agents are responsible for ma maintenance of the buildings and structures, authorize county building officials to require that the building or structures be reinspected and it has a defective date. Uh, on this measure, uh, let's see, we have the Hawaii Insurers Council testimony and support. We have Community Association Institute, CAI, uh, Richard Emery. Richard, are you on the call? He submitted testimony and support. Richard, is that you? That's me, Chair Baker, can you hear me? Yes. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mayor Baker and committee members. Uh, first of all, let me begin by wishing you a healthy day. Um, I represent Community Associations Institute on House Bill 2243. As a side note, I'm a CAI reserve specialist and recently participated on the National Task Force for CAI in the discussion of reserve study public policy as a result of the collapse of the building in Florida. And in some ways, uh, we believe that this bill began because of uh, the collapse in the building in Florida. And I'd just like to point out one thing to you on that. Uh, first, that the laws in Florida are quite differently. They knew of this problem for years because their laws required homeowners to vote and approve this repair that's why it never got done, resulting in the catastrophe. That does not exist in Hawaii, because what I learned on this national task force is that we have some of the most robust reserve laws in the state of Hawaii. So I've submitted testimony suggesting some amendments, because the current law already provides the board's authority to do this. Our concern with the current language in the bill that's provided is twofold. Uh, first of all, we prefer our amendments. But number two, when you look at building code, you have, for example, in fire alarms, uh, it's a little vague what building code applied because the current building code is vastly different than maybe when the building was built initially. Number two, to add designated agent, you know, managing agents are real estate brokers. They're not trained in building management or maintenance. And further, if you look at chapter 467, we have a duty of loyalty and obedience to the uh, principal, which would be the board of directors. So to impose the kind of liability on an agent, they may in fact may have no contractual duty and it just muddies the water. So I'm gonna summarize that by saying, uh, we believe in safety and everything that should be done, but prefer that the amendments we propose be uh, included. Thank you. Thank you. We have testimony and support from Palehua Townhouse. Association, uh, Jane Sugimura for um, 
Hawaii Community, uh, Hawaii Council of Community Associations. Uh, we have testimony and support from Kokua Council. Uh, Lourdes Scheibert, is she on the call? If not, we'll move forward. Associa, Richard Emery, Kokua Council, Lara Maui. I am, I am, I am. Okay, we have a short period of time, so I need you to summarize quickly. Thank you, Chair Baker and Vice Chair Chang for this opportunity. I represent Kokua Council and the seniors from condominium owners. So I would like to amend and correct the word agency and replace it with the original word agent. The verbiage of this measure is taken from the International Building Code 3401.2. This code addresses the owner, the board, and the directors. And also there's Mr. Mr. Fujisaki wrote a, a great article on June 2021 in the Hawaii Condominium Bulletin. What is needed in this whole educational program is for Mr. Fujisaki to be contracted to include the International Building Code, in particular the 341.2 maintenance and 341.3 alterations. Further, CAI and HCCA should include this information in their educational program. And REC should distribute the information to all property management companies and their real estate broker and employees, including association board directors and their resident manager employees. This is the law. In 1968, when my declaration was written up, it said that we are to obey all state and county laws. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Associa, Richard Emery, Kokua Council, Lala Maurer, R. Larry McGuire, Lynn Matasal, Jeff Sadino, Philip Nerney, all of these in support, and Dale Head. Dale, are you on the call? His testimony is this is a common sense bill which should be passed. Uh, let's go to the next measure, which is House Bill 1597, House Draft 1, relating to electrical contractors, specifies that the limited exemption under Act 65, Session Laws 2013, to the electrical licensing requirements for individuals working with high voltage, 600 volts or higher, is further limited by only electrical transmission and distribution, line construction and maintenance, and substation work. Extends until 2028, the sunset date for Act 65, Session Laws of 13, and associated reporting requirements of the exemption under Act 60, Session Laws of 2018. Uh, we have on Zoom, and I'll ask them to be brief, the Board of Electricians and Plumbers, Lay Ann Green. Are you there in opposition? Good morning, Chair. Thank they have you. your testimony. Thank you so much, Chair. If it's okay with you, uh, Mr. Philip Lucero is here, Chairperson of the Board of Electricians and Plumbers. Uh, Fine, as long as he will be brief. Uh, Aloha and good morning, Chair Baker and members of the committee. Um, you would, we are opposed to this bill and we find it too bored and it can open up a window for the user to start using non-licensed electricians in all work. Um, me, myself holding an EJ license and also a C13 license to do contract electrical work I have reached out many times to the C63 high voltage license contractors to assist me in any high voltage work. And I found no problems in finding men to do this work. And also an EJ license also looks to the NEC code book for reference in installation, repair and safety in high voltage work. Thank you, Mr. Thank Lucero. We do have your testimony. Thank you. I'm going to move forward to Hello. the Contractors Licensing Board. Candace Ito in opposition. Candace, are you on the call? If not, Good members, we... Good morning, Chair Baker and members of the committee. The Contractors License Board stands in, on its written testimony in opposition to this bill. And basically, they also believe that the exemption is overly broad. Thank you. Thank you. We have testimony and support from Hawaii Electric. Hawaiian Electric, Michael Swanson, are you there? I am. Thank you, Chair Baker and Vice Chair Please, brief. Please be brief. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, we are in strong support of both House Bill 15, uh, 1597 and Senate Bill 2644. We must have access to out-of-state journeyman line workers, cable splicers, uh, and substation workers. We have very high expectations. As you know, high voltage is nothing you can mess with if it is one of the top 10 most dangerous jobs in the world. So uh, we have to have access to the right people. Just because you have an EJ license does not make you qualified to do high voltage work. Okay, thank you very much. We have IBEW Local 1260 in support. Anybody on the call from Local 1260? If not, we have IBEW Local 1186 in opposition. Is there anybody else on the call that wishes to comment on House Bill 1597? If not, members, we're gonna take a brief recess and go into decision-making. Call the decision-making hearing back to order. We have two items on our agenda on House Bill 2243, House Draft 1, relating to condominiums. The chair recommends that we pass with amendments. Subsection C to be amended as follows. The board of directors is responsible for operation of the property as defined by section 514B3, which includes the administration, physical management, and fiscal management and physical operation of the property inclusive of maintenance, repair and replacement of and the making of any additions or improvements to the common elements and shall maintain the project in accordance with the requirements of the reserve study mandated under 514B-148 and all state and county requirements applicable to the project. And I'm putting a clean date on it of 1-1-2023. Any questions or comments? If not, recommendation of the chair is to pass House Bill 2243, House Draft 1 with amendments. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator DeCoy? Aye. Senator Nishihara? Aye. Senator Riviere? Aye. Senator San Manuel Ventura? Aye. Senator Favela? Is excused. The recommendation is adopted. Thank you, members. The last item on our agenda was House Bill 1597, House Draft 1, relating to electrical contractors. Uh, the, the Senate bill crossed first and is moving. Therefore, Chair recommends we defer this, this measure indefinitely. Any questions or comments? If not, that concludes our hearing. We are adjourned. Let's go.